Welcome to Gunship. Morning, everybody. Um, Sven from GameDuel. I have the presentation today with Rui, also from GameDuel. And we want to build cross platform libraries more modular. And why and how we are going to do this, we explain in our talk today, which is how we came to Hex actually with GameDuel and what we built with that. And then we talk about the modularity. And then we explain to you our custom made build system and environment with some live coding examples. And we have a, even a surprise in the end. So, first, this is me last year at the Hex conference. It can happen to you that you're sitting here and next year you're talking. I think this is incredible for Hex that this is possible. So, it was an awesome year. Um, yeah. Now I will introduce you to the story, the hex story at GameDuel. <coughs> so when we first came to um, hex, uh, first of all, uh, this is our GameDuel, and we are one of the largest games companies um, for social games in Europe, actually. We have over 200 people, and yeah, we also tend to work cross-platform now, and we build our own infrastructure, our own backend, and our own frameworks. And we released um, recently the French card game Belot on um, Facebook, Android, iOS. So, but we had to solve a big challenge there, which is developing cross-platform, and probably that's all what we want. Mm, so, but we took it. Um, like this, that we developed it for each platform separately. So one full iOS team, one full Android team, one full Flash team, building the libraries, building the games, but it took a very long time. And yeah, we wanted to level up a little bit. So we went here last year, and yeah, we try to use Hex, but the initial response was not that good. So they said, ah, you want to build cross-platform with Hex? <laughs> so, yeah, it was not that good. So many people at the company were skeptical how, how to do it, what to do with that, how, how can we build it? So we had to actually solve some tasks with that. And, yeah, we wanted to level up, but we had some requirements. And that requirements were we want to code at once, we want to build everywhere. We want to control our own tool stack, don't want to be dependent on other companies which have no open source. And we actually needed scalable workflows. So what we did over the last year, we built our own development stack. And we needed to extend the Hex ecosystem a little bit to make this work scale for a company. So from the last year to the next month, we scaled from two developers to 25 Hex developers at GameGirl, and eight of them are here. So during this one year of development and a lot of ping pong, we um, established a kind of a yes, tool stack, which is a dual tool, which we present today which cares about the environment, the versioning, and the build system, and there are actually 20, 15 libs in there. The Dual Kit, which is uh, responsible for making platform abstractions, and on top of that, we built our own game engine, and on top of that, the games. And with that stack, we are actually fulfilling the requirements that if there comes a new platform, that's not bad for our game engine because it relies on the dual kit and then we solve it in the platform abstractions. And we have now currently two games in development, one card game and one arcade game, fully hacked the entire tool stack. And yeah, we have two to come uh, in the next couple of months. I think in one or two months, the first one will go to soft launch. 
and we do online competitive multiplayer games. So we also have server connection and Facebook and social and all those things. And for iOS, Android, well, HTML5 with WebGL and Flash Target. So now how did we do this? Um, my dear colleague, Rui, will explain to you. Welcome. Uh, hi. Uh, so basically, we are going to uh, first explain a bit about uh, what we think is uh, a good way to develop and uh, yeah, basically good practices, and then we'll explain our environment and that was based on these principles. So the first question that I have for you is, uh, can hex libraries go beyond hex code? So right now, uh, when you make a library, you, can, you have a, a very standard system to share your, your code, which is, but it's just about hex code. So imagine if you want to make a library that goes a bit deeper into the, into the platform. So for example, if it integrates some iOS SDK, or it has some native code, or yeah. Uh, right now, there's, there isn't really any system for that. So what could we gain from standardizing that part? So this is what we have right now. Basically, uh, libraries don't, don't really have this standard. I mean, there are many engines out there which, where you can have these things. But if, if you want to uh, make a library that is shared between all of these engines, there isn't really any standard. So you can't share. You either make, for example, a Lime library or a Snowkit library, but they don't really share between one another. Um, and what, what happens here is that the engines become too monolithic. So uh, this forces the game engine developers to support everything in their engines that could be supported by libraries, by external developers. Of course, we, we can use Git to uh, make pull requests, and uh, the community is pretty nice. But still, uh, it would be nice if the library developers could have some more autonomy. Um, yeah, and so the native code is not easily shared between the engines. So if we had that, then possibly we could then share these native libraries, we could have less work for the engine developers, and we hope that having the engines do less and share more between one another would make them simpler and more maintainable. So this leads us to uh, another uh, interesting uh, thing that we, we see a lot in Hex and we think could be solved a bit better. It's already solved in the Hex STD, actually, but it's about, uh, right now in Hex, you see, you see a lot of this in the source code that you have a class, and uh, on each function, you always have some if def for each platform. Uh, we, as Kanasi said, we have now a lot, a lot more platforms and a lot more languages, which means that this kind of way of making the libraries doesn't really work for maintainability. Uh, after a while, you you are trying to do something so simple, but the, the source files get huge for no reason. So we think that we solved that uh, and by making, basically, we always develop like this. So we make an external class, which just defines the basic interface. And then we always very explicitly separate each backend, uh, where in that backend is just about that specific platform. Another thing is also about this uh, funny commit strip. Uh, I don't know if you know this website, it's pretty interesting. Uh, this happens, uh, basically it's about uh, that when you develop a, uh, a game or an app and you develop it individually to each platform, it takes a long time, but then it's, uh, it's, it's good. I mean, you can achieve uh, a lot of performance because you, you are basically developing with the best practices for that platform. So, but it takes a long time, so it's not really scalable. And then what happens a lot is that if you try to use a, a unique framework, I blurred out some of them to not hurt any feelings, but uh, what happens here is, yeah, the results are not always as good as people expect. And so, uh, yeah, why does this happen, basically? I mean, uh, we think that Hex is pretty cool in, in the way that uh, there, isn't, there isn't really any VM, I mean, the code that you are writing is very, the, the layer between the code that you are writing and the, the actual execution in the native platform is very close. So we can save a lot uh, like that. So, I mean, one example of this is, for example, JavaScript from Hex versus JavaScript from Mscripten. I mean, this is a, to a topic for another talk, but this is an example of that. Um, 
yeah, and Hex is also uh, pretty nice to access the native uh, parts. I mean, in JavaScript, you just do untyped or make an external, whatever. Uh, <laughs> in C++, it's not so easy, but that's where the having a standard way of making C++ libraries comes in. So, this is our mascot. Uh, he agreed with us. He, yeah. <laughs> Silliness. Okay, so here's, this leads us to what we're sharing today. It's not really an engine. We like to look at it more like an environment because it's basically an environment where people can uh, make engines on it and share a better ecosystem. Um, we think that the environment is especially nice for uh, open source, so it made perfect sense to, to share it with you guys today. Uh, and it hopefully also solves the issue with the standardization of the libraries. So this is an overview of this foundation that we built. So on the bottom, you have uh, basically our command line tool, which we call the dual tool. And all the platforms are plugins. So the main core of the, this tool uh, doesn't know anything about iOS or Flash or HTML5. It just builds generically. It has some uh, and a lot of hooks to be able to build plugins for any platform. So we have uh, some uh, plugins as an example. And then we have libraries on top of that, which implement the usual stuff that you see in most engines. Uh, the focus here should be really on the environment because that's what we think is really interesting. But as you can see, uh, we were able to, with this environment, you were, we were able to make complex things like OpenGL as a simple library, as a single library. So in this library, you have everything that you need to integrate uh, OpenGL in your app, basically. Uh, and what also a nice thing about having everything modular is that we can share between engines. So for example, let's say that you would make an SDL library uh, that in, has, well, SDL. So you would replace uh, something like input and OpenGL. So yeah, you have a shiny new engine. Uh, if, we, if we make things modular, it means that we can share uh, between the engines. So for example, um, if uh, libraries are built on top of the file system library, for example, all of those libraries can be shared between uh, the other engines. And right now this doesn't really happen because if you want to make something a bit more complex, you either have to tie it to an existing engine or, yeah. But let's focus on the build tool, uh, so the lower part. On our build tool, we have three types of plugins. We have a uh, set of plugins for, uh, it's in the bottom, to basically set up your environment. So when you start up with the tool, you just do like set up Flash, set up Mac, set up Android, and it downloads all the dependencies, etc. It sets up your environment to develop that. Of course, they are also plugins. So uh, the code for setting that up is very clearly separated. It's, if you only care about Android, you don't have to look at Flash code, for example. Uh, we have create plugins for just samples, and then we have the very important ones, which are the build plugins, uh, where yeah, it builds for the target platforms. So what actually happens when we build with our tool? Um, so for example, if you call something like dwell build iOS, uh, the tool goes into action, etc., and then uh, we update all of our libraries. So one thing that our tool uh, has is uh, dependency management. So when you uh, reference a library in your, uh, in your application, in your project file, then it automatically is downloaded and also updated. So for example, if uh, uh, there is a new release of a library, we immediately get it uh, automatically. This is very nice for hot fixes and stuff like that. Um, then the plugin gets selected and the plugin starts to work, so it goes into action, and then the configuration is parsed. Here, uh, one very nice thing is that the libraries can also uh, have configuration for themselves, and uh, they integrate the project file. So, for example, here, when you parse the configuration, the dual tool parses the, the generic things like app name uh, and dependencies. The plugin parses its specific things for iOS, and then we have the uh, library plugins where they also do some stuff. And then uh, when it's actually building, the tool tool stops doing anything and just the plugin and the libraries do stuff. Yeah. So our libraries can do uh, three things which we think are pretty nice. So they can parse XML. So you can have a, a standardized way of uh, 
providing configuration to the users of your libraries. Uh, they can integrate with the target platform. Uh, so you can really do very advanced things like, uh, uh, yeah, integrate SDKs from, like, for example, if you have some tracking uh, system or whatever, they usually have their own SDK, and so you can make one library for that. Uh, OpenGL, uh, basically any, anything that requires a bit deeper, deeper integration than usual, than just hex code. And they can also run code when building. So uh, there is already in hex, uh, the hex lib run thing that you can just include a, an echo. Uh, but here the, the code is actually run when you build, so you don't have to, have to uh, run it before. It's part of the build process. Uh, this is what our configuration file looks like. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it looks pretty similar to what you are used to seeing, but re here, really here, what is uh, interesting is not so much how the data is specified, but how it's parsed and how the code is organized that handles this to be maintainable and easy to extend. Um, so for example, this is the generic parts like file name, uh, a dependency. Um, then you have the platform uh, parts. So again, everything is separated. So for example, the, the flash part that you see there is parsed exclusively by the flash plugin. So if you want to know how flash works, you just look at things that say flash, basically, and everything, everything there is about that, and it's very easy to extend and improve. Also iOS, like uh, uh, you can even uh, do stuff on the Android manifest, and etc. So pretty interesting. The libraries also have a configuration. So for example, here, uh, like the middle one, the Atlas Packer, we have a library that when, when you build your app, it automatically uh, generates the sprite sheets for you. Um, and you can configure uh, where your atlases are. Mm. The Facebook, uh, we have a Facebook library and you just uh, in include the library and specify your app ID and underneath it does everything for you like link uh, uh, the Facebook SDK, uh, some info list stuff like this iOS things and Android. Basically anything that you usually do have to do natively, it's done by the library. So some examples, the Atlas Packer one that I already told you about. Uh, the hockey app, does anyone know hockey app? Yeah, so it's about, uh, it's basically about beta testing distribution and uh, crash logs. So if you, the service is pretty nice and basically when you integrate it, usually you have to integrate some SDK to uh, get those crash logs uploaded when the application crashes in your clients and um, and you also have to upload when you build, so you have your CI uploading whenever you build, so your beta testers can check it out. And of course, with this uh, library, we automated all of that, so when you build, when you include the library, and when you build, if you specify a parameter, it also uploads, and you just have to configure the, the app ID and the URL. We have a pretty nice game server library that uh, when it builds, you can configure on your project file which files you want to build for the server, so like some class paths. And then when you build, it automatically generates a jar. This is internal for our company, but it's something cool that we think you can do with this library. So it generates a jar, and then you can upload that jar to the server. And so we have this kind of workflow going on. Facebook, and we also have a purchase kit for yeah, cross-platform buying stuff, <laughs> basically making money. Um, yeah. Another cool thing that we have, this is completely uh, an addition, but yeah, we have schema validation and so because our XML is basically, ch it changes depending on what dependencies you have and what platforms you use. So uh, when you, uh, we call it the update command on the tool, it not only downloads the, the libraries and updates them, but also generates this mega schema from all the schemas of all the libraries. And then you, if you have IntelliJ, you can get super cool completion. Also, if you make a mistake on the XML, it crashes basically when you build. Because, yeah. So uh, now, basically, I will show you some of the code. Uh, how do I do that? It's not super easy to navigate. And my terminal coming soon. Oh, it's there. Great. <laughs> okay. 
Ah, now it's here. <laughs> um, OK, so clear that up. Yeah, um, so this is a project that we have. Um, just a simple example. It's on Sven's GitHub, if anyone wants to check it out. And basic, yeah, you can, uh, when you build, you just do dual build, and then João added actually a Z shell plugin for completion in the tool, whatever. <laughs> it was added just like half an hour ago. Um, yeah, so you can build, I will just build the basic thing just to show you. Yeah, so it builds, basically. Just an OpenGL thing. Can you zoom, zoom in a bit? Ah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure stream using what it's using. Mm -hmm. mm, zoom. Okay. I think there's like uh, one size. Bigger. Okay. Command plus, yeah. Ah, it doesn't work here. It doesn't really make it bigger. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, but on, on Atom, I know how to make it bigger, so I hope. Do you have presentation mode on Flash Develop? <laughs> 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 okay, because I think they don't. Um, yeah, anyway, so I will show you the tool. I already have it. So you get minus help. There's also, of course, this stuff. Uh, you get a um, bunch of parameters that you can call, etc. You can also get uh, help for a specific command. So, for example, for the build command, um, yeah, and you also get a list of possible plugins, also XML information that you can provide. Um, yeah, here are the plugins, like the usual ones. Um, I can show you a project file. I have one here of this project. Uh, yeah, so the usual things. Uh, the only library that's actually configured here is the file system. Uh, I can show you also a library. The OpenGL, so here you can see uh, how we actually make these libraries do a little bit more than just hex code. So for example, okay. So we have uh, a bunch of backends for each platform. On OpenGL, it's quite interesting about because uh, usually you just need to solve, in terms of API for OpenGL, you just solve it for C++ and HTML5 uh, because then C++, the C++ API works the, whatever platform you have that has C++. But then the interesting thing is really the context. So we have different contexts also for <laughs> iOS and Android and HTML5. And here in the backends, um, you see actually uh, the separation and so if you want to know how Android is done in and uh, OpenGL is done in Android, you just go to one place and you have basically this deep integration going on. Uh, when you make a library or a build plugin, um, you have to basically include uh, yeah, you have to write these interfaces. So if you want to add a new platform, you just have to include in your in your build plugin, in, in our library, uh, a file that answers to this thing, and then it will be called during the build. So you can do a lot of fancy stuff with it. One interesting library that we have to show that off is the file system. So the file system um, is basically just about getting files into the uh, target platform. Of course. This is usually very simple for web or uh, other targets, but when you have, for example, Android, where it gets zipped into the, to the APK, and then you have to unzip every time you access it. So this is all done with this library. And we have a, a build plugin to parse that configuration that I showed you before, which is just here. So yeah, this is the library build that it parses and does some stuff. And uh, it copies the files to the target platform. But the first thing that happens is actually the XML that gets parsed. So you can see here, this is just in the library and it's pretty simple to understand. So the, the XML gets parsed into the configuration. 
and the configuration is this thing here. There are three main things. It's the build, the XML, and the configuration on any library. And the XML gets parsed into this, and then it's built, basically. So uh, now comes my the rest of the presentation. If I can get to it. I think there was some other, another joke here. Ah, oh, yeah. This is our office at Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's a build monitor. Some builds are red. No, it's, uh, <laughs> should be green. Yeah. So, back to this slide. That is our development stack, the dual tool. We just explained to you roughly some of the dual kit libraries doing the OpenGL, the file system, and the game engine. And how nice would it be to have this open source? So, we put our two lowest levels open, um, open source to yeah, provide the solution to work for this in a more in an enterprise style and yeah, finally have some standardized way of integrating natively. Um, we really yeah, would like to share this with you that you can write engines on top of that because it's, it's nice to develop engines and yeah, easier work together with multiple people on it. And we really are keen to, yeah, watch how you like it. And you can enjoy the stability by using a, the versioning system, which is in there properly. And yeah, you would never have then like a, oh, it's split not anymore because it's versioned. And to summarize this talk, we talked about the, we wanted to make the cross-platform development more modular and we talked about the dual environment and that we put that open source on GitHub. You can install it by hexlib install dual. And yeah, let's use the dual tool and continue to create awesome framework for hex. So now you are ready to <coughs> shoot bullets. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, just broadly, not specifically, say I want to uh, include your, say, your payment SDK in with the enemy engine. Um, would I hook into the dual tool from the enemy tool, or would I place the enemy tool with the dual tool, or would I hook? the NME tool into the dual tool. So would I be a plugin for dual? Would dual be a plugin for NME? Or how would that all work? It's a question who we <laughs> waited for. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the thing is, the, the lower part of the, this, that we're sharing, so the dual tool, is actually, that, that specific thing is solved in a lot of engines. So like enemy, like Lime, like Snowkit, for example, uh, it's solved there, but it's not really, the problem is that it's solved everywhere, and we wanted to make one good enough uh, base that could be shared by the other. So what would happen is that, for example, enemy would be a library for, for in this environment. So we would, could remove all of the build system, all of the part about getting it to work on iOS, uh, on Android, etc., and just focus on the, uh, yeah, the platform abstractions, like the dual kit thing that we have. It's just an example. The real thing is really the tool that we are sharing. The, the libraries that we have there are just examples of what you can do with it. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, you were using external classes to describe your interface. So, uh, Sorry, what? You are using external classes uh, for describing the, the main interfaces for the Classes, ah, why, classes, why aren't okay. you using uh, interfaces for that? Uh, well, this was actually in the very beginning. It can be changed into an interface. It's just about the, the organization of the code. And we, the thing is, the extern is pretty useless. It's a pity. We could have some macro that checks at runtime if uh, the actual thing that you put in the extern is actually at runtime going. 
Uh, I think they have this in the Hex STD, which is uh, pretty nice, and I think they wanted to share it at some point. I don't know how that's going. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, it could be an interface, yes, or an external. It's just about defining the interface so that when you look at the library and you don't care about uh, how it works on Android or iOS and you just look at one file and you have the functions there documented and it's, that's it. And uh, one other question. I was wondering if uh, one of the reasons why you wrote this is uh, so there can be uh, separate contrib contributors uh, to work on uh, different languages for, for each library. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, it's really important for us. I mean, because we, uh, as our uh, background, as Sven said, we basically make, made a game where we made one engine for it, each platform. So we had a lot of specialists of each platform and we needed to somehow use their knowledge and one good way to use their knowledge is that they feel that they can uh, contribute in an easy way. So it was pretty nice because f for a lot of the libraries that we developed, it was basically uh, just three guys, one from each platform, and they come together, okay, let's decide on an API, and then they write it down and go back to their desks and write it out. And it's pretty cool because you just focus on iOS and then you come back and you see, oh, it actually works everywhere. So, yeah. Thank you. So I was wondering if you could clarify some things about the tool part of it. You mentioned how it dealt with versioning and hooking mm -hmm. all the libraries together and things like that. Um, do you use this in a regular Hexlib environment or does it extend to or route around that at all or how does it all work to handle versions and libraries and Git and all that? Yeah, uh, actually that was part of the presentation at some point. but. Uh, I kind of took it out because it was a bit boring. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we, um, we have the Hexlib environment where we, we integrate with the current uh, Hex world. And then we have this dual lib environment where all the libraries that are there are uh, on our environment. So of course we would like that Hexlib would also support this. But one of the reasons that we also did it is to clearly separate what is a library that is just Hex and could be shared in a pure Hex environment. and then. Another one which is uh, about the tool itself and integrates directly with it. Um, and we, yeah, we use uh, Git for, th for that also. That was also one thing that we needed because we, we version a lot. Uh, basically, I mean, our engine is what? No, 15. It's 15 and it's just one year. Because <laughs> every time we break compatibility, we always increase the major and we are not afraid to. So we needed something that allowed us to have a lot of versions uh, but wasn't creating a copy of, out of each version that you install. So Git worked pretty well for us because we can just change tags and it's that fast. So. Can I ask a follow-up question? So like um, one thing that's, I juggle a lot of different projects that all use completely different dependencies and <laughs> incompatible versions of like this will use version whatever of this library and this will use version whatever point mm -hmm. something of the same one. So I'm constantly going back and forth and switching. So within the dual environment, is that something someone who doesn't like work at Game Duel could possibly reappropriate your tool to use? Like set yeah. up a local config and have it just do it and then go over here and fix it for this project. Yeah, actually we have uh, two, two teams right now and they, are, they work quite differently. So for example, one team is always uh, a bit behind in terms of the the engine that we have, and then we have another team which is always super updated, and we they can still work together because uh, actually we I don't know do you know Cocoa Pods or this kind of Cocoa Pods? No. Well, it has this feature that you can when you specify a version for a library, you can specify it in a I don't know have the correct term for it, but basically, for example, if you say like 4.0.0 plus, and uh, if there is uh, another library which needs 4.2.0, it still works. So it, the dependency check, check checks for that. And it also downloads the latest one in, within the, the range that you specify. So yeah, that's how we basically solve the different libraries having different uh, dependencies. Of course, if the major is different, then it's not, back, it's not compatible, and then it's an actual error. But within the minor and the patch on the semantic version, it works.
Um, <clears throat> thanks, guys. Uh, it's very interesting stuff. This is good to see you again. It's fun. Uh, I, I really, really like your idea of modularizing the pieces so that we can begin to share them better. I think it's a great next step for Hex for all of us to share what we're doing. And I also really appreciate your idea of sort of extricating the build tools and infrastructure mm -hmm. out and thinking of them as an important separate piece. As uh, Nicola was saying, Hex will target a lot of languages, mm -hmm. but targeting the platforms actually requires a whole bunch of extra work. And NME and OpenFL are really good at that actually. And they support test and debug and a whole packaging and a whole bunch of other features. Um, I wonder to what extent, how you imagine that as a community we could try to work together to define those requirements and move towards building something that's meeting everyone's needs. Because I hear a lot of things you guys are doing that are similar to what other people do, mm -hmm. but they may do them in slightly different ways. Like whether it's a dependency on Git, or like a specific tool, or a specific infrastructure deployment. I just wonder if you've thought about how we could organize to try to identify how, you know, where the gaps are and which things are specific and unique and how to make them pluggable uh, along that path. Yeah, uh, the thing is, when we started this, we made it basically for the company. The, that was the main objective, was to get it to work. But then we actually saw that, okay, uh, we have so, so many people working on this and so many teams and they can work independently. And we thought, okay, this might work for open source. Of course, there are some specifics that might not be uh, of the, everyone might not agree with it, but we are, of course, flexible to uh, change it somehow. Of course, this thing about having two library environments is kind of weird. It's also nice because you, then you know, okay, I have this library and it, if, if this library is here, I, I know it works on any dual engine. You know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for example, what we really would like right now is that, uh, for example, NME or Lime would take over this thing and then they could share stuff between one another. Because right now they do share, but it's a bit uh, hacky, I would say. Yeah, it's not super. And it's also about uh, the independence of the developers. Because uh, when we started this, we actually started with Lime. Uh, and then building the stack on top of it. But then when we wanted something super specific, I don't know, like using Neon instructions in Android. I mean, we needed to convince people that this was the way to go. And so we had all these specialists saying, ah, but if you use that, then it won't be, you won't have control. So, and then we tried to do that and um, we couldn't do that out of a library. So we always had to make pull requests for that. You know, so we needed to have some way of giving independence to library developers that they can really go deeper into the platform that they have. Yeah. I was going to ask about the choice of XML over JSON. Because uh. in, in Hacks it's very easy to type with type defs and abstracts your, your JSON. So you can, anybody could sort of parse it themselves and do other stuff with it. But obviously XML may not be quite as easy. Yeah, uh, we actually started off with JSON, uh, but eventually we changed and it's just for one reason actually. It's the, the ifs on uh, the, the XML. Like for example, you have some tag and you want to make if iOS. In JSON, you end up with really huge things and like you have to make like, for example, I think it's SnowKit, they do like, conditional and then they have for each platform. So it doesn't make the XML so easy to read. And when we changed that, we looked back and yeah, it, it, it was much more easy to use. I mean, the XML is really about uh, being easy to use uh, as a client. Of course, parsing, <laughs> it's not so hard in, in, in Hex, so uh, another, Java. Uh, another small question. Um, when, you're, when you're using it and you have stuff that's working, is there a quick way to just tag Yep, this is working, and mm -hmm. then you go back to that setup. And he was talking about like multiple libraries with different versions for different mm -hmm. projects. It's quite useful to sort of be able to tag quickly where you are. Yeah, this is we use Git basically. So when you want to release something, you just tag it, and uh, anyone that, for example, if you if you uh, if you just commit on the the master or whatever, it doesn't get downloaded to everyone, uh, but only when you tag, and that's basically making a release. So you just tag it, and anyone that uses the library when it, they update, they do dual update. They get it downloaded immediately. So. How does your dependency management tool know where to find a library? 
What, sorry? How does your dependency management tool know where to find the repositories for each library? Is that yeah. managed in a central location? We have a, I think I can show you, but we have a uh, repo list thing going on that uh, when you set up the tool, you set it up with a repository list. And we currently, it, by default, it sets up with one repository list that is on uh, GitHub. But we have our own internal one. And so, for example, for uh, if you are develop, developing just in open source, you just need the main repo list, or you can make one for your own libraries if you don't want to. Yeah, and we have our own internal repo list uh, uh, in the company. And so, when it updates, it looks for these two uh, repository lists and uh, yeah, checks out the, the correct one. So, for example, if you don't want to share libraries, you can just make your own repo list and do your own stuff within your own company. Just a, a quick question about the uh, Android uh, code generation. Is that built on top of Ant or Gradle? Uh, it's, yeah, it was basically, we took it from enemy and just used it. Uh, the same concept, so it's Ant, yeah. Uh, Afterwards, <laughs> always. So, um, Basically, I mean, it sounds great, you know, increased collaboration and modularity and stuff. How do we get over the problem summarized in that famous XKCD comic where 15 competing standards, we need one that meets everyone's standards. Mm -hmm. Very soon, there's 16 competing standards. So, um, what's, yeah. what, what's, what's um, have you thought about that and how will this, um, you know, it, it's, it's something we've wanted before but kind of had, mm -hmm. you know, just accumulate standards. How can this be different? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, I mean, I think this only happened because uh, of all these tools that were created over the years, uh, none of them actually separated the build part and uh, from the, the rendering and, and stuff. So it's a pity because we could already have something like this uh, because enemy is al also doing this, but it has the, adds in all the other stuff, uh, which you might not want. And so for, in the beginning, it will, uh, if someone had made this, it would be fine. Then we would all be using that one and extending that one. But since that wasn't the case, uh, we had to make this one. And we hope it's always, I mean, at least it works for us. So <laughs> we, <laughs> that's why, yeah, we would love that people would use it and uh, it would be shared. But it's up to, I guess, you. <laughs> and uh, No more question? Okay. Yeah, it's okay for you? Yeah. We have Thank one you more slide. Yes. Yeah. No, no, this Yeah, we are hiring, so we are desperately also looking for Hex developers. And if you're interested in a growing team, as I said, from 22 uh, last year to 25 this year, all switching to Hex, um, visit our site at insight.gameduel.com, and here are our email addresses for the reference. Um, yeah, enjoy the Hex conference, and thanks to Silex Labs and the team. Welcome to Gunship.